Tonight we continue the discussion about the escalating war between Russia and Ukraine. Why is Europe's second largest country fighting Putin's army alone? Welcome to q and I'm Stan Gray, and we're coming to you live from Melbourne tonight. Joining me on the panel, lecturer in digital cultures at the University of Sydney, Olga Boychak. Liberal member for McKellar, Jason Falinski. Former Director General of ASIO, Dennis Richardson. Shadow Minister for Defence, Brendan O'Connor. And from Sydney, senior writer from the Sydney Morning Herald, Deborah Snow. to have you all with us here on the panel and you here in the studio and you at home as well. Remember, you can stream us live on iView and our so social channels. Quanda is the hashtag. Please join in the conversation. We publish your comments on screen from Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Let's go to our first question tonight. It comes from Christina Komet. Thank you, Stan. I'm just wondering, how will history judge this extraordinary week? Good question. Good question. Because uh, it has been an extraordinary week. And Olga, for you as a Ukrainian, watching what's happening, having friends and family there, what's going through your mind? Thank you. Thank you, Stan, and thank you, Christina, for your question. I am not a historian, but as a Ukrainian, I can remember instances in history when Ukraine was being exterminated, when Ukraine was under attack. And we can go back to the 1933 and 32. We can go back to when Putin first started the war in 2014. And so right now, I am also thinking that this is a very uh, pivotal moment. Uh, we are living through the eighth day of the occupation of Ukraine by Russia, of a full-scale occupation. And it is extremely hard for me as a Ukrainian to witness uh, my country being being destroyed from from afar mm. and so right now we we see a lot uh, we see that Putin is bombing civilians we see that he's committing war crimes <laughs> we see that he is bombing universities hospitals and uh, this is just devastating this is really concerning and I guess my question when I'm watching it all mm. from here in Australia is when will it stop you know when will be that point when something will be done. So we see the world supporting Ukraine as much as they can, but also historically we know that <clears throat> sometimes this support wasn't enough and sometimes this support wasn't, uh, didn't come in time. And so I guess this is a broader question about the value of human lives that are being lost right now in Ukraine. And what do we as, as the society value in, you know, what, when will we think that this is enough and what can be done? And certainly a lot of that we're going to be unpacking throughout the program. A lot of questions go to that. Dennis Richardson, when you look at this and with your long history and, of course, your long involvement in issues such as this, what does it speak to you in terms of what we are seeing playing out and how it will be defining this era or be remembered? Well, I think in terms of the past week, uh, we're witnessing one of the great watersheds in Europe. Uh, we had the two great wars of the last century. Uh, we had the Cold War, followed by the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the, and the Soviet Union in the late 80s, early 90s. This is the next great watershed in Europe on from there. Now, what that means in terms of history, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but uh, Putin has made a big strategic play. Uh, I think he may not have expected uh, the NATO countries to be as unified as what they are. Uh, they clearly plan their sanctions carefully. They'll take a long while to bite. But you asked uh, in your opening introduction, Stan, why are they standing mm. alone? Well, overnight, 135 member countries of the 193 members of the United Nations voted outright to condemn uh, Russia for its invasion. 35 countries abstained. 
and, and four countries voted with Russia. North Korea, Syria, Eritrea, and, uh, and um, um, next door to Russia, oh, Belarus. Uh, uh, Belarus. 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 Now, if your four, four friends in the world are Belarus, North Korea, Syria, mm. and Eritrea, you've got a problem. Deborah Snow, former Moscow correspondent, to watch all of this play out, um, what does it say to you about this moment? <clears throat> Well, I agree with, with Dennis. It's a, it's a massive watershed moment. Um, the, one doesn't like to think about worst-case scenarios, uh, but already we've had talk out of the Kremlin about um, uh, putting their strategic their nuclear forces on some kind of alert. One hopes that's, that's bluff. Um, there has to be... I, I desperately hope that behind the scenes of what's going on with the UN and the, the, the European Parliament and so on, that back channels are still open. Uh, I, hope, I hope for Europe's sake, for the world's sake, also for Ukraine's sake and for Russia's sake, that back channels are still open somewhere. Mm. Uh, because if this keeps going, um, you know, towards... Uh, increasingly uh, grave scenarios, then um, it, it, it's a very perilous moment, not just for Europe, but for the world. Jason Polinski. Uh, well, Stan, I, I, I agree with everyone on the panel. I, I think what this is really about is, and it may turn out to be a hinge moment in history, because for the last seven decades we've had a global world order based on the rule of law. Um, what is happening at the moment is you have authoritarian regimes, both, he, both in Russia and elsewhere, pushing that law um, to the side and trying to assert that if you have the military capability, then you are able to assert yourself over smaller and less powerful neighbours. Um, if we are to maintain uh, Western order um, and a sense of an international order based on law, this has to be the moment when the West stands up and assertively pushes back on an aggressor. Because we saw in Crimea, we've seen in Syria and in other places that when we don't, it simply escalates to the next moment. And I think in our region, we have authoritarian players who will be looking at this, not in the short term, mm. but in the medium to long term, about determining whether the West has the will to continue to maintain an international order based on law. Christine, I want to come back to you in just a moment because, of course, you're involved with the Ukraine community here. But I'll just get a comment from you, Brendan, before I do, and, and flip that a little bit, picking up on what Jason has said. What it says about Russia this week, but what it says about the, the West and the ability to meet an authoritarian threat, what do you take away from this week? Well, I think, look, it's been a, a tragic week and uh, history will judge this week. Um, as, a, as Dennis said, as a watershed. However, we don't know how this is going to unfold. And what we, an optimistic view is that because of the, the scale of the uh, response of condemnation uh, by the European Union, the, the United States, Canada, Australia and other countries, I think that at least, um, let's hope, will mean that President Putin will be rethinking his position. Uh, and as uh, has been said, we would hope that there would be some lines of communication open still. And it's one of the reasons we haven't, for example, dismissed the ambassador of Russia, mm. um, because however odious it might seem, uh, ongoing communication uh, with the Russian state may be um, our best hope in preventing the escalation but in so escalation of this matter. Now, it's hard to say to Ukrainians, this is, it, it could get worse than this. Mm. But the, frankly, it could get worse than this. Uh, and therefore, every effort has to be made to prevent that from happening. And, and hopefully, there'll be some cessation of conduct by Russia uh, towards Ukraine. Christina, uh, you are the, the executive of the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations. So yes. I want to ask you about that. and 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 how the community is feeling and how they're coming together. Olga said how difficult it is to watch on. What's it been like for you? This last seven days have been extraordinary, Stan. Um, 
Leading up to it, there was a lot of discussion. What will he? Will he? Will it be tomorrow? Um, as Australian Ukrainians, we were we're living it from afar, as Olga said. But for our family and friends that are living in Ukraine, uh, they were living on the edge and living. You know, going and to school, going to work, kids going out and playing in the playgrounds, um, planning their holidays, and. Literally at two o'clock on Thursday afternoon our time, I rang, picked up the phone and rang friends and family and mm. said, two words, Dan, it started. I woke friends and family and said, it started. And you could hear them, them waking. And it was very emotional. Um, how have the, how's the Ukrainian community come together? Um, we're a nation of fighters, as you're seeing um, mm. what's happening on the ground at the moment. Um, 40 million people over there are doing all that they can. Um, you know, initially when the war, well, this war started, because of course the war's been going for eight years, when this invasion started, um, they showed a lot on television of the mass exodus of people, the cars leaving. But a hell of a lot of people are still there and they're fighting because they are determined that they will not give up that soil, they will not give up that land that is theirs. It is not Russian, it is Ukrainian. So how are we putting, pulling together? We've had rallies, we've, um, we're pulling together with the government. The government, um, both sides of government have been absolutely amazing. I've been in wonderful meetings with both sides. The support has been tremendous, but we always have to say, please do more. Ukraine is fighting this on its own. Yes, now they're being uh, weaponed up. Now there is being support. But with my involvement, Stan, I know, and you hear, has Red Cross arrived? We're hearing these questions every single day. Who else is there? Who is helping? I got a phone call today from a friend, friend of a friend, and they said, we have family that are underneath an apartment in the basement, and there's, there's shooting going all around, Stan. Mm. And they have no food and water. Women, mm. how can you help me? And I said, how can I help from Australia? How can I help these women get food and water in a basement of an yeah. apartment building yeah. just outside mm. of Kyiv? It's interesting you raise what's happening on the ground there because it does take us to our next question. And it's on video and it comes from Irina Babiak in Lviv in Ukraine. Hi, my name is Irena and I'm from Lviv. My home, my land, my nation is Ukraine, where I don't feel safe anymore. Our land is crying because even children are dying. We have a good leaders now. We have an army I'm really proud of, but we cannot protect ourselves from the bombs and rockets and the sky has become our enemy. Please tell me why NATO is not helping us right now by closing the sky. At least this is 21st century. Thousands of people are now homeless in our country or even dead or injured. What kind of world do we live in not stopping it? Please explain. Thank you. Yeah, Brenton O'Connor, I'll go to you on this. Um, after the election this year, depending on the outcome, you may well be mm. Defence Minister. These will be the questions that will be landing on your desk. And when we look around and we've been hearing this, yes, NATO is supporting, yes, the US is supporting, but they have said absolutely we will not put troops on the ground. The US will not spill blood to defend Ukrainians on their soil. Mm. And you hear this question a lot. Why not? Well, I think firstly, it's not just whether, in fact, the United States wants to uh, invest more in this conflict uh, for its own domestic purposes. For example, President Biden may well be concerned about what people at home would be thinking about insofar as U US involvement. But it's also about uh, a calculation about mm. how uh, Putin would respond if NATO, uh, NATO countries were involved in a military conflict. Now that is, a, that is really uh, ratcheting up uh, and escalating uh, the conflict which could lead to untold, unknown consequences, but they would be dire. Um, now I'm not saying that, may not, that could not happen. Uh, already we're concerned, of course, uh, Poland being a neighbour of Ukraine, uh, could, there could easily be an inadvertent incursion or assault on that country whilst uh, Russia's attacking Ukraine. 
Now, at the moment, I think if you look at the extent of the support through uh, military and not, um, lethal and non-lethal support, if you like, by, uh, by NATO and by other countries, mm. including Australia, I think that's the appropriate response. But we're hearing it's not enough, Jason Falinski. We heard from yeah. Arena there in the question. Why not close the skies? What are other things that can be done, let alone going in and actually helping out oh. on the ground? Sorry, can I just say? Yeah, yeah. Can I just say this that that as we are having this conversation, you can be assured of this: that national security agencies of countries involved in this matter would be considering all of these options. If you think about it, it's within although, a week. Although the, the option yeah. has been taken off the table, um, Joe Biden has said we will not be doing that. He said it again but, in but the State of the Union. Yeah. He did that for a good reason. He said in the State of Union address, yeah. "If we are in conflict with Russia." It will be a world war, mm. possibly nuclear exchange. So the reason why there is not a, a no-fly zone is because this is not Syria, uh, this is not Iraq. Uh, to put a no-fly zone over the Ukraine against Russia would mean direct conflict with Russia, which would mean a wider war, which could mean a nuclear war. And, and Jason, does that then not say to Vladimir Putin that he is an open door? Um, Stan, I go back to what I said earlier. I mean, um, you know, Barack Obama stood up and said a red line in Syria mm. is the use of chemical weapons. A year to the day, the Assad regime used chemical weapons and the United States did not respond. That sent a signal to authoritarian regimes around the world that Western governments were not willing to take the risk. Now, Germany opposed um, the uh, sending arms to Ukraine before this conflict began because they said it would be provocative. It, to, has, it has now decided that it will it, commit now to it that. Has so decided, we're, seeing a, we're seeing a change. Now it has decided to do it. Now, uh, Dennis is in a better position than I am to comment on this, and I suspect Olga is mm. too. But I openly wonder whether if Germany was not so reliant on Russian gas, if that would still have been their view. There is no doubt by us not taking action earlier and not actually providing the support that the Ukrainians need, and by us I mean the West, if we have made this a less costless exercise for Vladimir Putin to undertake. Now, that's a, now that's, that's a question for historians. But where we stand today is, Dennis is right, you cannot have direct conflict between the United States and Russia and the Russian Federation. Well, Joe Biden has said that's a, and, that's and, a world war. And, and the reasons for that are that it quickly escalates out yeah. of control. However, there are plenty of other things we can do to help the Ukrainians protect themselves and defend their sovereign nation. Let, let me get a comment from Olga on that. Is, is, do, you, do you share the view of, of Arena there that the West could be doing more? I do. In fact, I do, because I, I do agree that uh, this was happening. We saw this coming. This buildup was escalating. And every time there were comments about tough guy diplomacy, about uh, posturing on the part of Russia and the United States. And that makes me very angry, because people who made those comments have no stake. They have a privilege of sitting somewhere in Australia, uh, in the West, and just saying that nothing will happen, it's not a real threat. We saw, that, we saw it happening and it continued to build up. And as, as Christina said, once it started, it was already too late. And so I do think right now, my question to, to everyone, I guess, is do, is there then a threshold where this will be a world war, right? How many Ukrainians do have to die? How much has to be destroyed before the West steps up? Well Robin Morrison is, um, is in the audience with us. And, and Robin, you've been watching this and thinking about this and, and making these calculations, as other people have been doing as well. Where do you come down on the idea that there could be more the West could, be do could do? Or would it be a provocation and a, and a dangerous escalation? I think it would be a mistake and a dangerous escalation. This isn't about putting troops on the ground in a war with Iraq or with Afghanistan. This is Russia, one of the biggest armies in the world, huge nuclear arsenal. Um, we'd end up in, in a global war with the two biggest nuclear powers uh, in the world, and suddenly we'd be going from a, what is really a regional conflict 
to a world war, which I just don't think is any, it's, anybody's interest. It's, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because there are no, and we've heard tonight, and Dennis knows this well, that there are no moral absolutes, there are just moral choices. And yet we know, as Olga said, people are going to die in Ukraine, a democracy, a sovereign country, and the world's biggest army is not going to, take, to have their back on the ground. These are really hard moral choices, aren't they? Yeah. Dennis, the, the question that, that, um, that Robin raises there is a real one, and that is this question of nuclear conflict. How real would that be? Well, you could certainly paint a scenario where this conflict could unintentionally slip into a wider conflict leading to a nuclear war. Now, I don't think that will happen, uh, but you could paint a scenario whereby Russia uh, achieves its objective in the Ukraine, which is a puppet state mm. of some sort. Um, uh, they either kill or imprison President Zelensky. Hopefully that does not happen. Um, they take over that part of the Ukraine they want. That then leads to urban guerrilla warfare, being with the guerrillas being supported, with the resistance being supported out of Poland and NATO. Russia over time becomes frustrated by that. Perhaps an accident happens somewhere between Poland and Russia leading to a bigger conflict. Mm. You can't exclude that. Um, I think Putin pulling the nuclear card out of his back pocket, as he did the other day, to my mind, was a sign of weakness, not of strength. D Deborah Snow, how, how do you feel about this? We listen to this and, and there are no easy answers and there are no, there are no good outcomes in, in any event. And that line between engagement or escalation is such a fine one. Where do you sit on that? Well, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. Um, uh, I can really understand the frustration of the Ukrainians, uh, feeling that they're getting every kind of support except the kind of support they most want at the moment, which, as they have repeatedly said, is the enforcement of a no-fly zone over Ukraine to enable their very brave citizenry and their army uh, to fight back as best they can without being pummeled uh, from above uh, by Russian forces. I, I really get that. I, I, I get the frustration among uh, Western audiences that uh, they want to see their governments doing more. Um, but I very much agree with the scenario just sketched by Dennis. Um, the moral choice is, um, you know, from, from an awful scenario to unthinkably bad scenarios. Um, and that's why I say I hope back channels are open. By back channels, what I mean uh, are ongoing forms of engagement uh, between whatever part of the Kremlin still has some feelers out mm. uh, beyond its own sort of tight paranoid circle. Um, and whatever form of uh, diplomacy engagement is out there, whatever form of talks, I mean, there might have to be a face-saving uh, accommodation reached. Uh, both sides will probably have to, to give ground if there's going to be some kind but of accommodation reached at some point. Now, not, it's too early to talk about that. I accept that. That's the key, isn't it? Um, both sides having to give ground. And Olga, I think, is already looking askance at that. Olga, you're sceptical about that. I am sceptical about that. I mean, Russia is a terrorist state. We do not negotiate with the Taliban, right? Why do we negotiate? Why do we keep treating Russia as if they are they haven't broken the norms of international law? That's that's just one comment. But the second comment, I was uh, thinking about the nuclear threat and the threat of. Hmm escalation, right, and Putin has enabled, so there's four levels of uh, nuclear preparedness in Russia. He's now at level two, so it's mm -hmm. not yet, there's no red button for him to push on his table, but 
uh, it's, it's getting there and he's doing it of course to deter any action, uh, the enforcement of the no-fly zone. But there is a very real other nuclear threat on Ukraine's territory right now and that is the Russian army having captured the Chernobyl exclusion zone and they're weaponizing the radiation because, because right now when they're there they, are, they can't be attacked, nobody would shoot in, into that location. So, so while we're talking about metaphorical nuclear threats, which are might materialize, might not, there is already a yeah. nuclear threat inside of the country that might uh, and, realize. Yeah. And Olga, that leads to our, our next question. It comes from Sasha Gillies Lakakis. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, so as someone who comes from the Russian community here in Australia, I've been pretty outraged by the narrative created by our media depicting the Ukraine as the good guy and Russia as the bad guy. Believe it or not, there are a lot of Russians here and around the world that support what Putin uh, is doing in the Ukraine, myself included. Uh, since 2014, uh, the Ukrainian government, together with Nazi groups like the Azov Battalion, have besieged the Russian populations in the Donbass, killing an estimated 13,000 people, Can I... according to the United Nations. That's a lie. That's yeah. lie. Could I finish? Please? Just, just, just quick, quick, quickly finish and then, and then we'll come to yeah, that yeah. and put that to the panel. So yeah, my, my question is, you know, where was your outpouring of grief and concern for those thousands of mostly Russians? Um, <laughs> okay. When, 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 when you mention, when you mention the 13,000, yeah. um, the United Nations has listed 13,000 total people killed yeah. since the conflict, but you're, try, you're trying to suggest that is Russians killed by Ukrainians, and I think we need to point out that, that it, the United Nations has pointed out there is 13,000 killed since the conflict began in 2014, so we need to be very clear on that. Yeah. Um, can, 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 I yeah. just, can I just put this now, leaving aside your, your personal views on this, can I just put that question, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you, Jason, on this. The idea that there is a moral equivalence or there is two sides, we know that Vladimir Putin has said that there were provocations as he sought, the, the uh, encroachment and enlargement of NATO. He has claimed there is a genocide in, in the Donbass, which has not, the evidence has not been presented to support that. But the allegation here that there are two sides of this or provocations that led to this. How do we look at this in its totality without diminishing what's happening on the ground <laughs> and bring some, some... Is that possible? It's really simple, Stan. There is no moral equivalency to murder. Just because someone is murdered does not give you the right to murder someone else. Secondly, the sovereignty of a nation cannot be simply wiped out because one individual decides without evidence that he's going to do that. And this is critical. We live in a world at the moment that is managed by rule of law. If we change that to a position where people just get to decide what they want to do because they've got more guns than the next person, that is not a world I want to live in. And I don't think it's a world anyone wants J to Jason, live in. Jason, can I also, can, can I also go, go to you on, on this point, and that is that you have uh, Russian heritage yourself and your, yeah. your grandparents come from the Soviet Union. Well, my and when grandmother. Your gr gr yeah. grandmother. <laughs> but your, your grandparents came from the Soviet Union. Well, no, Mike, so. it's very Anyway, complex. it's very... Yeah, yeah. Families are complicated. Section 44, okay. you know, it's all on the public but, record. But, but, when, <laughs> but when you hear this, that there are Russians supporting Vladimir Putin, as we heard, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I, I don't care. Hmm. I don't care. There, there, there are international laws. And I mean, to your point, um, Stan, which, which goes to Dennis's point, there are no good endings to this. Hmm. I mean, we sit here back in Australia and we go, well, one country's invaded another. That's wrong under international law. Let me tell you the people sitting in those countries. If you're Poland, you've had a thousand years of people marching through your country and for 600 years you were wiped off the map. How do you think the people of Poland are going to feel when you have Russian troops sitting on their border? The people of Latvia, of Lithuania, they're not, they're, this is not going to end well unless the West is incredibly assertive about pushing back this unwarranted... Bre Brendan. Well, I think that th there's a real question here about the misinformation that's deployed by Putin. Um, firstly, whilst they are not, no one's perfect, no independent states without corruption or issues, of course. And, and U Ukraine is a, a relatively young uh, democracy, uh, independence, I think 30, just under 30 year, 31 years. 
Um, but Putin has been deploying misinformation uh, for, for years. Uh, I mean, he, he is undemocratic by nature. He kills off his opposition. He uses all forms of um, propaganda. And what he's done here, and not, uh, what he's done here is misrepresented uh, the conflicts that have happened within the Ukraine to serve a purpose, the sort of false flag assaults where he contrives an attack and says it's Ukraine attacking dissidents in the Ukraine. Now, there might be occasions in which that conflict does happen, but it is also the case, and I believe the experts are right in suggesting that it is Putin that is quite often contriving these matters for his own purposes. Mm. Let us go to our next question. It comes from Nick Sherry. Nick. Um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question about the evolving conflict and how we've seen numerous wars and conflicts go by, um, but in this one in particular, we're seeing a lot of use of social media in this war zone. Mm. Um, how much of an impact can social media play on this conflict and how big of a variable is it to consider as well um, in terms of what's going on in Ukraine? Deborah Snow. Well, um, it's clearly having an enormous impact. Um, uh, one could argue that I think one of the... It might have been Brendan was talking earlier about uh, uh, Germany's initial reluctance to stump up any sort of military aid to Ukraine. Uh, and one suspects that one of the reasons that that position has changed is because of the weight of popular opinion um, in Germany and throughout the West, in fact, where uh, social media, uh, as well as what, what we're seeing on the nightly news, um, is, is having an enormous impact. Um, you know, there's genuine outrage. Uh, we all feel it. I feel it. Uh, when you see, uh, you know, children with cancer, uh, on life-saving treatments, having to be bundled down into a basement every few hours because of uh, shelling. I mean, it's horrific to watch and it's horrific to think about and uh, it's horrific to try and put yourself in the place of those people. Um, so all these things, uh, which of course get magnified um, by, I think they've called it a TikTok war uh, mm. at the moment, although I, I also noticed that uh, our government has um, engaged TikTok and other social media platforms um, to try and ensure that they're not running Russian source content. That's another whole debate. Um, but no, social media, enormous impact, but we do have to be very careful, all of us, about what we're consuming, checking that it's coming from reliable sources. Mm. Dennis. Um, look, I'd simply make the observation, I think it's probably right, if you go back over the last 20, 30, 40 years, it's difficult to think of um, people demonstrating in Western countries other than against wars. You know, by and large, the wars that Western countries have been involved in over the last 40 years have had some significant opposition from within their own domestic uh, reach. This is, a, uh, this is a conflict in which, up till now, the weight of popular opinion appears to be on Western governments to do more, not less. Not necessarily to engage in conflict, but certainly to do more. And I can't quite remember the last time there was something like this, mm. where people were out on the streets demanding that their governments do more. And I think social media has a lot to do with that. Olga, I might just get a quick comment from you on this, because, the, you know, we can talk about Vietnam, for instance, being the, the television war that brought that home to us all. We live in a different age now. And how does that change the nature of conflict? Absolutely, Stan. This is, this is a very, very important to think about because the wars, the ways in which we understand wars have largely been formed by the wars of the last century, by World War I, by World War II, by the Vietnam War. We remember the CNN effect, the mm. televised living room war. Yeah. But what we're seeing right now is really different. And that is that has been caused by the kind of the penetration of the digital technologies into the battlefield by each of us having a sensor that essentially we can witness the conflict mm. in many other different ways we can know and understand the conflict. So in the Ukrainian case, it's been a blessing and a curse. Of course, we know that all of it, a lot of it started from Russian disinformation that got spread through social media, through Russian social media, which are now blocked in Ukraine. But we also can see 
how social media can allow people to have that agency to frame what is happening in their localities, to witness, to help us witness the conflict. We also know that witnessing is, is not neutral. We know that witnessing the, uh, the army of the enemy can help uh, increase defense capabilities in a country. We also know that witnessing your own army can help the enemy know where their mm. positions are, right? So even that act of witnessing, it's very not neutral. Also, a lot of uh, the Ukrainian president, he is uh, a skilled entertainer, and he's actually been able to fight back and to raise the morale of his army and of the people by addressing them on social media. So it's uh, actually argued whether Russia thought it through to not switch or kill the internet in the areas that they're trying to occupy because there's been so much resistance because of the information on social media. And finally, the coordination, right? There's a lot of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, generating humanitarian aid that's happening on social media as we speak. And mm. so all of these processes are really important and they change how we understand wars. D Dennis, can I, can I come back to you on, on something that we've seen speculated a lot and this has been, we've seen this in, in, in social media as well, and that is about Vladimir Putin's mental state um, and what would be going through his mind. There have been reports about him being isolated, um, not taking advice or becoming increasingly desperate. What is the sort of conversation that goes on in intelligence circles around trying to ascertain something like that? Well, I'm no longer in hmm. intelligence circles. But, but, I, but I, I think you might know how it works. No, but Stan, look, I think there's a couple of points on this. Other people, I don't know Russia particularly well. Other people know it a lot better than me. But um, first observation I would make is that Putin probably has less constraints on him than the Soviet rulers. After Stalin, the Politburo worked up to a point. Khrushchev, for instance, was replaced because he overstepped the mark and other leaders were replaced. Putin does not have a Politburo. Putin is essentially a modern day czar. It's the first point uh, I would make. Secondly, I think uh, people I know who know Russia best, Russian speakers who have followed Russia for decades, for the last 12, 18 months, they have been speculating amongst themselves about Putin's mental health in terms of what they've seen and what they've noticed on, 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 on TV. And I think, uh, I think US intelligence played the lead up to this conflict very well. I think there's, there's, a, there's a degree to which they got inside Putin's head. Mm. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think Putin quite expected the US intelligence to play it the way they did, foreshadowing what Putin was going to do. And I think he's made a bit of a miscalculation uh, to that extent. But uh, he, um, people talk about the oligarchs should do more. I don't think they have a lot of influence on him. I don't know who has influence on Putin. I'm sure there are people who do, but it would be a very small number of people. I'll come back to Deborah Snow as a former Moscow correspondent, just trying to re get a read on this at the moment, and, and Vladimir Putin. What do you take away? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, I'm not sure whether the uh, Dennis is probably right that the Americans might have got inside his head by forecasting what he was going to do. I don't know if it seems to have slowed him down any. Um, Look, I think he he is surrounded by a very small group um, of men like himself who've come up probably through the you know through well not probably did come up through the KGB. Uh, so he's head of national security, he's head of intelligence services, he's defence minister. Um, I think I read somewhere their average age is 68. Not that there's anything wrong with 68-year-olds, but for all of them, you know, the, the cardinal event of their adult lives has been the dissolution of the former Soviet Union. And so if he's got this sort of narrow group around him, and, and of course COVID has done strange things to people's heads all over the world, and he's sitting there in large rooms with people, you know, at the end of very long tables, 
and uh, and he's got increasingly uh, marinating in these historical grievances that we all know about, and the people around him are doing the same. Then that does kind of breed a kind of collective paranoia um, that that probably is unhinged in a way, um, and and that's why I keep coming back to this theme of trying to keep something in the Kremlin connected to the real world. That is critical. Hmm. I want to change the pace now. We're going to come back and, and talk again about what's happening in Ukraine. But of course, we have uh, an emergency here in Australia at the moment, a flood emergency at home. And I'd like to bring in Rosalind Irwin in Lismore on Skype. And Rosalind, um, you've been doing it tough there. How, how are things for you right now? Oh, well, I think they've been fairly difficult. Mm. Um, as people would probably know, the small businesses, particularly in Lismore, have been absolutely devastated. They were just recovering from the flood that we had in 2017 and then the pandemic. And now this has happened and they have been totally devastated. And so I want to know what the state and federal governments are going to do to help Lismore get back on its feet because just being all good together mm. isn't going to do it. Jason. Um, thank you, Stan. Uh, sorry, Jocelyn, is it? Yeah. Sorry, Jocelyn. Um, Jocelyn... Um, oh, Ro Ro Rosalind, no, sorry. Rosalind. Sorry, Rosalind. Pardon me, Rosalind. Um, Rosalind, um, look, there are, there's $375 million in a rescue package for um, cities in uh, on the north coast of New South Wales that have been impacted by the flooding. The Insurance Council of Australia has announced that they're releasing the money straight away and will do... Um, uh, will do their assessments later. The Australian Banking Association has announced that banks are suspending repayments. Um, uh, Service Australia has received, as of yesterday, 172,000 calls and have released $62.7 million in funds. Um, you know, as you know, there are a lot of volunteers and a lot of um, rescue organisations at the moment trying to get to the clean up and make sure that both people and property are protected and survive this and get people back on their knees as quickly as possible. I think in the case of Lismore, and this might not be the right juncture to talk about it, um, there needs to be infrastructure built um, because we know, due to climate change, that these sorts of events are going to happen more often. Um, and we need to have the proper infrastructure in place to ensure that when they do happen, people in particular, but property also, are protected so the impacts of those weather events are less than they currently are. Brendan? Well, of course, it's an absolute tragedy what's happened uh, in Lismore and other parts of northern New South Wales and south-east Queensland. It's not the first time we're seeing these um, floods uh, and other natural disasters uh, happen more readily, uh, more often, uh, and as Jason said, as a result of climate change. And it's for that reason we need to build more resilience and we need to be planning, we need to be ready. It's not just responding, uh, which we are doing now, and that's what we should be focusing on, responding to the, the disaster, responding to people in need. That has to be, of course, our priority. But one of the mistakes we've made, I believe, is we have not been investing in infrastructure. Uh, and if you think about what's happened in South East Queensland, I was the Acting Emergency yeah. Minister in 2011, and I travelled throughout that whole area. Now, I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but in that last, in that 11 years, we should have built in um, resilience and had more investment uh, around levees, around evacuation centres, around irrigation systems, uh, and, and, and those those types of um, physical investments that should have taken place so that we were mitigating the likelihood of having the same disaster um, visited upon the people of South East Queensland or northern New South Wales. Rosalind, we always seem to be playing catch up, don't we? We have the bushfires and we say we should have done more, we should be more prepared and we have the floods and we think we should be more prepared. And What more can be done? What more? You said you'd like to see more from state and federal government in terms of preparation and mitigation and um, being able to, to anticipate some of these things. Rosalind? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't sure you were talking to me. But could I say that the, all of those things sound really good in terms of building infrastructure, but what I would say now yeah. is that looking at what's on offer, I don't know whether people realise, but almost every single shop and small yeah. building in Lismore mm. is absolutely broken and gone. And 
can I say that whilst it sounds good, people have not been able to afford flood insurance in Lismore for many years because it's far too expensive. So that doesn't really help small businesses. And on top of that, they have to, they have to make good for all of the things that they've lost and they have to refit all of their premises. I mean, this is a huge amount, but, but could I just simply say, for example, we know that uh, in our shop, there's $50,000 worth of product being lost, there's $50,000 worth of coffee that's been lost, and we have to start again. A shop has to be refitted out, there's lost income. I mean, it sounds great when you talk about getting things to prevent, to make things better, mm. But you have a disaster here, and I don't know how Lismore can get back on its feet unless we have much more significant funding for what's mm. been damaged already. Well, you hang in there, Ros, and we were just looking at some of the images there um, as well, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been tough. We're looking at images of some of your shop, and people there are doing it, are doing it really tough, so, so thank you very much. Something's been bothering me, I have to admit, you know, since we had Sasha's question earlier about Russia and it's been playing on my mind and Sasha people here have been talking about family who are suffering and people are dying and I understand you wanted to ask your question about is there some reasoning for this but you supported what's happening hearing that people are dying and can I just say I'm just not comfortable with you being here could, could you please leave I've, I, I've been it's really no, Sasha. I'm sorry. You 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 can ask a question. You can ask a question, but we cannot advocate violence. I should have asked you to leave then. It's been playing on my mind, and I'm sorry, but I have to ask you to leave, please. Okay. Well, could I? No, no, no. Please, please, please. Just, 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 just out of respect. Just no, please. We're not having the conversation, Sasha. We, we can't have people advocating violence. And I should have asked you to leave. It's been playing on my mind. I wanted to have a, a proper conversation about these things, but I have to ask you to leave. I'm really sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for that. But you know, these things happen. It's live television. You think about these things. It's really been troubling me that we can have a conversation and we can look at where, where, where the arguments are and we can try to look at the sides of the argument. We can't have, have that, and I'm, I'm sorry, it should have happened earlier. Our next question is a video, and it comes from Prajwal Bataram in Brisbane. I was seriously affected by the floods in 2011 in Queensland. This time around, thankfully, my home's gotten away with just moderate flood damage. We live in an era of mounting climate change impacts, and all I see from governments is reactive policy, not proactive policy. This is when we should be taking concrete steps towards adaptation, towards emissions reduction. This is what the IPCC says. So do we as a nation have a plan in place that will let us deal with both the short term and the long term effects of what is to come? Yeah, Brendan, it, it does come back to that question we talked before. And, and you know, um, when you're in government and we've seen criticism of the handling of COVID and we've seen criticism of the handling of bushfires, it's harder when you have to make those decisions. You may be having to make them. Yeah, and, and we've been in government before. Yeah, no, it's and, the, and the same things have happened. It's easy. No, no one's suggesting that. And, but I mean, clearly on the broader question, we need to have a global answer to reducing emissions and we need to play our part. And frankly, I don't believe the current government can put its hand up and say it's done its Role. I mean, we're the only country that's reduced, you know, abolished a market-based uh, um, um, mechanism to reduce emissions. I mean, what other country would have done that once we put it in place? Uh, this government did that, and since then, we've done too little in responding to climate change, and that is a that is a real failure uh, for this nation. And to, to, to some extent, we're seen as a pariah in, in the international community in terms of our failure to do the right thing with respect to these matters. I mean, that's on the broader mm. question, and I think Labor's got a better plan but I also think in just in terms of the disasters that have befall befallen the people of South East Queensland and Northern New South Wales some of them just come down to also physical investment uh, so that we can mitigate these matters and very little has been done we've got a fund currently a 4.8 billion dollar uh, fund uh, emergency response fund where no money has yet been spent out of that fund it's been there for three years why 
Mm. That's the first thing I'd say. Now, Labor has announced that we would have a disaster ready fund, which means that you are spending money on infrastructure to mitigate and reduce the likelihood of disaster uh, that, is, that is occurring now. So they're, they're the sort of things you can do okay. that complement uh, finding the right climate change policies. Let, let, let me go to Jason, because you, you raise climate change, and Jason, I know that you've, you know, you've yeah. talked about having better targets or more rigid targets for 2030 as well, as well as the 2050 net zero target. You've got people in your own, uh, your own constituency who have been sandbagging just today, haven't they, preparing yeah. potentially yeah. for rain. So, yeah. so, you know, we can all be better in hindsight, but what needs to be done in the future? Well, um, look, that's a massive question. And I, I mean, this is a, a global problem and a global challenge. Um, Australia has reduced its carbon emissions by 20 per cent on 2005 levels. We've now upgraded our 2030 targets to 35 per cent. There'll be a further upgrade, I imagine, uh, sometime this year that will see that number go even higher. Uh, we've committed to net zero by 2050. I would say to Brendan and to others who criticise that, um, that we are one of the few countries in the world that actually has a detailed plan about how to get to net zero by 2050. Um, uh, I think that we will see as uh, more and more technology comes online uh, that you will find that target by 2050 becomes um, more and more possible. Mm -hmm. When I first started studying this in the early 90s, not because I wanted to, but because it was part of my degree, um, it looked insurmountable. 30 years later, the, all of the key pieces of technology we need to make this happen now exist. It's a matter of commercialising and deploying them. Um, in terms of uh, the emergency relief fund, which is a $4.8 billion fund, the point of that fund is to generate income from the capital. And $50 million was spent last year, 50 some, $53 million will be spent this year on exactly the things that we were talking to Roslyn about, which is building a levy in, in Lismore so that when you get the next event, um, the town centre is protected from rising waters. Um, making sure when we rebuild bridges, that they're built slightly higher so that the next um, rain event doesn't take out that bridge. Making sure that we build weirs to slow down um, water so that it doesn't wipe away things and it, and it holds water back. And also, we know that we are going to have longer and hotter summers and then we're going to have wetter summers. Mm. So we're going to need to be able to harvest water in Australia and store it in a manner and form that we haven't been doing for the last 60,000 years. Dan. Let's go to our final question tonight, and it comes from David Anderson. Whilst the government... Oh, I better put my glasses on for it. <laughs> I know, I know the fit, David. I have mine whilst, here. I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. Whilst the government is banking on a khaki thinking election, will voters be thinking closer to home? Hmm. There's a couple of things to that, and before I go to the politicians, I, I think I'll go to you, Dennis, on this, because you've had some things to say about potentially weaponising intelligence or creating scares or security being used inappropriately. Are we heading for a car key election? Uh, look, if I could say, Stan and I took issue with the government on one question, mm -hmm. and that was what I considered to be an attempt to create the perception of a difference in a particular area of national security where there wasn't one in reality. Uh, having, uh, leaving, leaving that to one side, are we heading to a Kaka election? I don't know. Um, it will depend what the election will be in May. Uh, it will depend on what happens in, uh, in the Ukraine and in Europe and the wider world between now and then. Um, uh, I, I think... Um, National security will be a bigger element in the election than what people might have thought a year ago. Whether it's a khaki election, I don't know. Having said that, I'm prepared to be unpopular and say that, <laughs> uh, and say that I think there is a, a little bit of mythology in respect of 2001. I worked very closely with John Howard in 2001 when I was head of ASIO and John Howard worked hard at bipartisanship in the context of counterterrorism. I know that mm. from personal experience. So when we talk about khaki elections, we need to keep a sense of perspective. Deborah Snow, as a journalist, how do we have that conversation about security 
and decisions that will be made by voters on who is going to be best at dealing with security without it becoming weaponised and politicised and divisive? Well, I, I think it's always um, it's a fairly desperate card to play. Um, I think in an environment like this, we've had so many shocks in the last two or three years. Isn't it extraordinary that we're not even... The word COVID hasn't even come up in this hour. Mm. I mean, that tells you how fast the pace of events are moving. Um, we all thought the election was going to be about the handling of the pandemic. That seems to be at the back of everybody's minds at the moment. Um, I think the attempt to uh, weaponise, you know, the, 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 to the extent that there was a, a, a rather hysterical attempt made to suggest that the Labor Party was somehow advancing uh, Manchurian candidates a few weeks ago was patently ridiculous, and I suspect most voters would have seen right through it, not to mention the potential blowback on the coalition uh, for alienating very large numbers of um, Australians of, of Chinese heritage. So I think they have to go very carefully. Uh, now, of course, Russia's the bogeyman at the moment. Uh, well, should, sorry, Russia is the villain at the moment, definitely. Um, not a bogeyman. But um, I think that probably the populace wants to see bipartisanship. Um, there, there's so many crises that we've got to deal with um, at home with the floods, um, climate change. The IPCC report didn't get a mention earlier, but, but I should mm. just raise a flag for that, that we've been warned that the world has a very narrow window to act. And uh, uh, the UN Secretary General Guterres described this latest report um, as an atlas of human suffering if action is not more urgent worldwide. So we've got all these other problems. Mm. Um, I, th I think the temptation should be resisted to turn this into a so-called car key election. Of course, we can talk about national security. The opposition should be fully briefed. I think we would like to see our leaders speaking with one voice on this, not trying to use it to buy votes. And yet, and Jason, I'll come to you in just a minute, but Brendan, there are questions that are asked legitimately on the record about whether Labor is a better option or whether Labor is strong enough mm -hmm. on security. And we often hear the quote about the, 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 the defence spending of 2012, 2013, 1.6% 1 of GDP, which was, you know, a low figure. Some say the lowest since, since the Second World War. Um, so that's a legitimate question, isn't it? And what guarantees well, can you give going forward of course, of course, about... Yeah. about I mean, you, you're, yeah. you, you may be Defence Minister. Indeed. Can you see defence spending having to get above 2% of GDP? What are the increases and demands going to be made on us to, to, to do that? Sure. And, and look, uh, quite often we will hear the government uh, talk about our record. It's, not, it's a little selective. I mean, the, 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 the expenditure from the former Labor government compared with the Howard government was still between 1.7% and 1.8 for the entire term, uh, they are comparable. Um, of course, now there's been an increase in expenditure, as there should be. And since 2013, Labor leaders have committed to a minima of 2%. And frankly, given the circumstances, we may see, of course, more significant investment in defence. And that's, and that's a matter of course. And that, of course, is, is commensurate with the, with the increased risk and instability in the region. So any decent government would be thinking that way. And I can assure you, Labor takes national security very importantly. In fact, whether it's called a khaki election or not, national security is the most important matter for any federal government for any federal government, and, and it will be for an incoming Labor government if we're elected, because it is the most important responsibility to secure the nation and its citizens. There is no more important uh, matter. But to answer David's question, because I think... Oh, well, may, may I say first... I there, think, there were, I think, David's also saying there yeah, may be other things we can talk I was about. Say, I think the Prime Minister made a terrible mistake. A terrible mistake, a desperate, uh, motivated by desperation, sure. But I don't think it was in his interests, ultimately, or for the Minister for Defence, to attack Labor in the manner in which they've done. It has not helped the government. It doesn't help the country. And frankly, now what's interesting, well, now we have a real matter we're dealing with. All of a sudden, as, as Deborah mentioned, so we are getting briefings. The, the government's cooperating. We're cooperating with the government. That's how it works. Well, let, 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 me, let me go to Jason on this. I mean, looking back on that now, Jason, and you've, you've heard that um, you know, Dennis Richardson was critical at the time. Was that a mistake? The Manchurian candidate comments, the, 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 uh, the, the trying to create that sense of a difference when it comes to China, oh, a mistake? Uh, look, to, to be blunt with you, Stan, I, I think the Manchurian comment was over the top. 
it was said in the heat of question time, it was withdrawn straight away. Um, equally, Anthony Albanese said it the next day. It was, it was frankly childish. Um, but, um, David, to your point, I, I think the next election will be about two key groups, um, people who, who, work, who have to work for a living and younger Australians who are looking to buy their first home. And I think that the really key issues will be about creating an economy that not only creates jobs but invents jobs of the future, getting house prices down and more affordable, um, national security, because we are now increasingly living in a region that is very dynamic. And I think um, the net zero by 2050 plan is key to all of that. I mean, I say to a lot of Conservatives in my party, it's not just about, and it is, it, it is about the climate, it is about global warming, but it's also about creating um, our economic future and jobs of the future, and it's also a national security document, because our greatest vulnerability as a nation in a national security sense is to fuel supplies. If we can move our transport fleet from um, diesel and fuel to EVs and hydrogen cell vehicles, we have solved one of the great vulnerabilities that we have mm. as a nation. Before we go, we only have a minute or so left, but I, I'll go, um, you're talking to your family, we've been talking about what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, um, and I wanted to give the opportunity to you to, to speak to people about what is what your friends, what your family are going through right now and what you would ask for from people in Australia. So my friends and family, uh, a lot of them are staying, as, as Christina's. Uh, a lot of them are staying. Some of them have joined the territorial defence units locally, and they're willing to do what it takes to not uh, allow Ukraine to be occupied. And so this is a very... They're putting themselves at tremendous risk. They're understanding the costs that freedom of freedom. It's really interesting to reflect on Ukraine's national anthem that says we will lay down our heart and our soul, our body and our soul for our freedom, which is actually the, what is being asked of them right now. And I think, I, I mean, I think this is, a, this is a broader question. What can Australia do for Ukraine, right? Mm. When is that point of, of the world stepping up and uh, sheltering the sky over Ukraine, introducing a no-fly zone, whether we have a threshold that we can think of and what that threshold is. But another thing uh, which, which gets me thinking after Sasha's question, uh, is about, and, and that is also relevant because of the elections, is the media. We mm. still have people in Australia who genuinely support Putin. We still have people in Australia who watch Russian media. So one of the very significant things is to outlaw the broadcasting. We're, we're still, we still have all those channels present in Australia. And, so, and then we have people who genuinely harbour those, those, uh, those beliefs. And so I think, I think uh, there is definitely the need for increased military aid. There is a need for increased humanitarian aid. That is out of question. And, and I do believe that there has to be a point we have to decide when. But I, I, seeing what's happening in Ukraine, it's really, it, it's, it's got to happen soon because there might not be any Ukraine to save anymore in, in a week or so. so. So this is critical. But also we have to talk about whether we are allowing a platform for Russia to, for Russian state-run media to continue spreading the propaganda. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, uh, apologies for the disruption earlier. It's not a good thing to have to exclude people from debate. We come here in good faith to have open conversation, rigorous conversation. We've heard different points of view and we, we encourage different points of view here, but we can't, um, we can't have anyone who, uh, who is sanctioning, supporting violence and killing of people. So I'm sorry for the disruption. It was not a vetted question. It was a question that was, um, you know, a, a rogue question, if you like. And, um, you know, it's not good to exclude people, but we have to, um, we have to take those, those steps from, from time to time. That's all we have time for. And thanks again to our panel, Olga Boychak, Jason Volinsky, Dennis Richardson, Brendan O'Connor, and in Sydney, Deborah Snow. Thank you for your questions as well. Next week I'll be back with you live from Sydney. We're looking at power, politics and progress. So I'll be joined by podcaster and entrepreneur Lillian Flex Mami Ahenken, businesswoman and educator Wendy McCarthy, refugee and gender policy advisor Najiba Vazivado, and founder and editor of online magazine Quillette, Claire Lemon. Until then, stay safe. Have a good night.